Hey everyone, Professor August here, and today we're going to be talking about this little book called The Coin by Yasmin Zahar. Yasmin Zahar is a Palestinian author. Um, I don't believe she lives in the United States, though she went to school here, I think, for her master's degree. I could be wrong about that. I'll have to check again. Um, but this is a fabulous book that I was really conflicted about when I read it. So I read the book about two weeks ago, and I just had to sit with it. And I've had numerous conversations with friends about this book, people who have read the book and people who haven't read the book. And I've really found it difficult to explain because this is unlike... Like, it's just not what I expected when I picked it up. Um, I always have this anxiety when I pick up a book by like a Russian author or an Iranian author or a Chinese author and like there's always this anticipation that they're going to lean into the trauma and like talk about how, how hard, horrible life is. Um, and when they don't, it just is super refreshing. And so, you know, like I picked up this book knowing that it was a Palestinian author who'd written it and was like really kind of hoping that it wouldn't be another trauma story. Um, not that they're not useful and important, but also like, that's not like, it's not useful to minimize a culture to just trauma. And so like, let's look at all the other aspects of uh, a people. And so this was very much that latter category of, of here's a modern woman who is very wealthy and she is making her way through New York and making decisions that don't make a whole lot of sense. Um, and the book itself, the character, the writer, Yasmin Zahar, like it's totally unencumbered by the tragedies of Palestine. Uh, it all lurks right there under the surface. So like, as you're reading it, you can feel the tension. You can feel the instability of the character because of where the narrator comes from. You can feel the colonization. You can feel um, the story of a people who have been displaced and harmed over decades and decades and decades. But the book doesn't talk about it. Um, there are like small instances here that make a slight mention of what's happened in history uh, in Palestine. But for the most part, we're, the book focuses on the character itself um, or herself, I should say. And so that was really refreshing for me. So I was, as I was reading it, because, you know, like I teach Middle Eastern history, I teach Islamic history, I teach Asian history, Asian American history. And so like all of these things are always like right there at the fore for me. And so st taking a step back and just looking at a character was nice. Um, that said, there is a lot that happens in this book that you can tell is manifesting because of trauma. And so the decisions that are making don't quite make sense unless you sort of couch it within the historical context of uh, a culture lost or a nation lost. And so the issue of Palestine sort of is right there and it's always present. Um, there's also this really interesting thing uh, thing with the coin that actually like is present throughout the whole story and the coin that is being referenced to is a shekel so it's the colonizer's coin and so we'll talk about that in a few minutes um so it's a really great book uh, uh one note to the publishers i don't know who came up with this or who thought of it but you know when you were like i don't know if this is a thing anymore because of like tiktok and technology but when i was a kid we always had these like little flip books uh where you'd like flip through the book and like a little image would move uh, the publishers have an actual coin that's rotating on the bottom right of the um, pages. And by the end of the book, it's like fallen flat. Uh, really nice touch to the publishers. So whoever thought of that, really good. The plot of the book is really simple. It's a woman who comes from Palestine and ends up in New York City and becomes a middle school teacher. So there's not a whole lot else to say other than the book kind of follows her trying to figure out life in the United States as a really wealthy Palestinian woman who really ought not be a teacher and falls into a scheme to make money selling Birkin bags with a homeless guy named Trenchcoat. I mean, like, there's not a whole lot I can disclose in terms of plot without like super ruining the story um but like the story actually unravels itself with the two characters so i think it's best to just move forward and talk about the two characters the narrator and trench coat who uh she sort of befriends there are a number of characters in this book but all of them are sort of minor characters, except for the two uh, major ones. The first is the narrator, and the second is Trenchcoat, who you meet maybe in like the first quarter of the book. Um, and Trenchcoat sort of like, he appears and then he disappears, and that's about it. Uh, the narrator, uh, she's not likable. I, uh, I don't even know how to describe her. Um, I don't like her as a character because she is so similar to me in so many ways and it was hard to read it like 
I like I read this book a while ago and I've been sitting with this character for a while and the way that I've been describing her to some of my friends are it's like she's the person who knows that she's the main character of her own movie and everything revolves around her so like I'm the type of person where if somebody cuts me off while I'm driving I get really pissed off because like how dare you cut me off but if I do it I'm justified. Like I'm really important. I have to get to work or I have to get to the grocery store. And so like, that's the mentality that she has where a lot of the stuff she does is justified because she's doing it. And you don't quite understand why she makes the decisions she does. Um, And like, so that it like hit home with me in a way that I wasn't expecting. And I don't know, I really didn't like it. Um, She's really unique. So she's unnamed. There's no name for her as the narrator, but she is a Palestinian woman who has come to the United States from Palestine and is a middle school teacher. And for all intents, she is somebody who is helping the youth, except she really isn't. Uh, She sort of abuses her position of authority. She even says so as the narrator early on in the book, where she says it does like she wasn't meant for this job. She doesn't know the literature of America or the West the way that she's supposed to as a teacher to teach these kids. And so she walks into this classroom and she just knows that as long as she can get her students to excel at state tests or like standardized tests, she can do whatever the hell she wants. And so you see her in different vignettes of the story doing things that she probably shouldn't do as a teacher, like um, a certain field trip she takes her students on or giving incessant numbers of free days to her students where she says like, you can sleep in class or you can play on your phone or like do whatever you want, unwind. Um, And so there are certain things she does that are kind of problematic. The reason she does this is because she's a very wealthy woman and uh, like her dad, I think the number was like $28 million or something like that, that she, uh, her dad leaves to her and her brother when he passes away. Um, It's a lot of money. The problem is the brother is the one who controls the money. And so she only gets like, I don't know, like 10 grand a month or something and living in New York, that's not enough money to survive. And so she takes on this job, but you know, she knows that she's this wealthy person. So a lot of the decisions she makes uh, reeks of wealthy people making weird decisions that the rest of us can't make. Um, And so her teaching method is one of them. And then she comes to meet Trenchcoat. And Trenchcoat is this unique guy. He's homeless. He uh, is of the belief that you dress the part. So like when I was in school, our teachers would always say, dress for success and like you'll become successful. Um, It's all about perception. And so he is poor person who dresses really, really well. He has name brand clothing, some of which he gets out of dumpsters. The way that he and the narrator become friends is she, the narrator, throws away one of her coats. And then a few weeks later, when she goes back to this dumpster to try and find it, it's not there. And of course, it's on this homeless guy. And so they sort of strike up a weird friendship. I don't know if it's a friendship. She's like weirdly sexually attracted to him. And he, I think, is gay and not attracted to her or like is only using her for financial gain. Uh, And he hatches the scheme to take her and they're going to become rich by uh, penetrating their way through Hermes stores in France, buying Birkin bags and selling them. And so throughout the novel, like there, it's not like a huge part of the novel, but there are certain parts of it where you get scenes where the two characters go into the Hermes store, um, they dress the part, like she is wealthy, so she just dresses the part normally, uh, but he somehow manages to like dress wealthy. And they go in and they just play, like they act the part of being super wealthy until they can get broken bags. And I don't know, I've never been in an Hermes store, I should probably go, there's probably one here in San Francisco that I can go to. Um, I think I went into a Burberry store once, like years and years ago when I lived in Chicago, and I thought it'd be funny to buy little baby shoes for one of my friends who had a baby and I walked in and like the shoes were 500 bucks. So like, of course I ended up at target cause I'm not in that tax bracket yet, but it's America. So like, I'm going to keep trying until I get there. Uh, so, you know, these people, these two people, they manage to actually do it. They make some money. They go back to New York and then the friendship sort of falls apart. Um, trench coat, like you don't really get a good sense of who he is or what he's about because she, the narrator doesn't actually know, like, Trenchcoat's background is not disclosed at all. Um, He doesn't talk about where he comes from. He doesn't talk about where he lives. He doesn't talk about family or friends. So you don't really get a good sense of who he is. He's just the guy who who believes, dress the part, and then you'll make it. Uh, The narrator, on the other hand, like, man, she's just on this downward trajectory throughout the book. And like, at the very beginning, it starts with the 
I guess the namesake of the book, the coin where she discloses that she was, when she was a child, uh, her family was in a car accident and her parents die. Uh, but as like, before that happened, she was playing with a coin and she like opens her mouth and it sort of like goes into her mouth and disappears. It's not that she swallowed it. It just sort of like magically disappears. And then years and years later, she discovers that the coin is inside of her body and I, it is like manifesting as a psychosomatic sort of idea. Um, and she believes that the coin has lodged itself somewhere in her back, like below her shoulder blade. And it's the one part where she can never physically clean when she's going to take showers or bath, uh, bathe. And so it's like that one dirty spot in her body. And I think a lot of this is, it's allegorical for a lot of things. So um, she's Palestinian. There's the coin that she swallows is a shekel. Um, so it's about col uh, colonial heritage and it's about um, having to use, you know, the language of the colonizer, the currency of the colonizer. Um, in co colonial discourse, the colonized are the dirty, the bastards, the backwards people. And the fact that she swallowed the shekel um, makes her feel dirty. There's that one spot that's always dirty. And so the undertone, the theme that kind of comes about in the story is uh, manifesting itself in OCD. She's really clean. It's like she's a super clean freak in her apartment and her um, the way she dresses, the way that she bathes in her classroom, she just keeps cleaning everything. And so that's one way that it's manifesting. Um, the coin kind of like has different roles in the story. So like one is the actual physical coin that she feels is part of her body. But then the concept of the coin is also really present because one of the ways or the way that trench coat and she try to make money is through the selling of Birkin bags. And, you know, of course, having a Birkin bag means that you are super wealthy and you have coin. And so there are different ways that you can interpret the coin. Um, it's not really a character, although like you can make the argument that she's talking to the coin in certain parts of the book. Um, but, you know, that's up for interpretation. Uh, she herself unravels. So as the story is going forward, um, you get to see that she, like she really just is manic she's making decisions that don't really make sense um she by the end of the book is like taking the outside world into her apartment so she creates this world for herself that is um like new york on the inside of the apartment so it's really dirty and smelly and like you know i'm not even going to try to describe it because it is kind of gross and i can't believe she did some of that actually had to go back and read some of those pages because i was like did she board up the bathroom and like decide to potty in a like a kitty litter tray. Wait, what? Yeah. Okay. So like there are parts of it that I was like, oh, th this is these aren't rational decisions. Um, so on the whole, she's not like super great as a character, but because she is so manic, uh, you just want to keep reading to see what else she's gonna do. This book is actually really easy to get through. There's not a whole lot that makes it difficult in terms of language. It's very straightforward. It's not florid at all. So it's straight to the point. The sentences are quite easy to get through. The book itself is not very long and the chapters are very short. So it makes the pace very quick. Um, there are two things that might be kind of difficult. Uh, one is the thematic issue, which is there's a lot in there that is traumatic and sort of like lurking under the surface. And so it might become complicated in that sense, but really it's just a straightforward story. Um, and yeah, you, you're going to sit with it with, for a while like I did, but it's not hard. It's not difficult. In terms of um, style, there's one issue and that is, but you'll get over it very quickly. And that's the way that the dialogue is written. There are no markers. So there's no quotation marks. There are no italics um, the same way that, and I see this a lot in recent literature where um, like exposition and uh, backstory is just in the same style or the text is the same as the dialogue. And this is the case with this book where you'll be reading a sentence and it's just, you know, exposition. And then the very next sentence is dialogue, but there's no indication that it's dialogue other than like a capital letter. Um, there are markers like he, sh he said, she said, but other than that, there are no quotation marks. And so you get used to it after like the first couple of pages. It just is something that you have to get used to. But other than that, it's quite easy to get through the book. Um, I did really enjoy it, actually. Uh, so I'm curious to see what other people think. Uh, there's a link below uh, so you can purchase it if you want to. Uh, otherwise, see you guys in the next video. Bye. All right, guys. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe below. Catch you in the next video.